so this is now after the lunch break. Uh, I th so I, I think we established that IBM early on, right, maybe right from the get-go on the uh, 3480 cartridge, made the decision to cooperate, in fact, help establish media standards uh, yeah. in the industry. Uh, somebody said they, they had planned on 10% of the market, letting the rest of the world... Media. Media market, yes. Uh, any more elaboration on who made that decision and how early it was made? Or it sounds like it's right from the beginning. Well, I don't. I let me just give an observation. Listening to what they said, you've got a manufacturing plant facility that's built in ten that had a maximum capacity. If you want to provide more than what was projected, you have to build another facility, and the company wasn't going to do that. Therefore, you have you know your capacity. You project what your volumes are going to be. And it must have been like a 10% projection that our capability was against the volumes, and therefore you had to do something different. Is that somewhat correct? Well, I, was I, I know that, that when, I, when I joined in 78, there was already a plan in place to produce an ECMAT and ANSI standard. Okay. It was not an afterthought. It was, as far as I know, it was from birth. And I was told that the actual projected media worldwide demand for 3480 was going to exceed IBM's ability to produce by a factor of 10. And, and it was on purpose that we did all this. Now, for all I know, there might have been some royalty stuff going on that I didn't know about as a young engineer. That justified it. Don't know, that justified it, right? I don't know. Jules, I, I mean, you're, you're also back to that era. Um, I don't have anything to add to that. Um, I originally, if I think back to when we we laid out the specs for the Building 10 in, in Boulder before we moved, um, part of the decision was what we thought at the time was we would be able to handle our capacity. Now, that decision was obviously wrong by the, you know, the 10 times. The other 12 media vendors. That you, and and the other thing is, that decision was made long before we really had a good handle on what the tape drive looked like. So, as we learn more about the tape drive, what John's talking about comes into play that all of a sudden the projections for quantity increased significantly well beyond what the plant's capacity was. I mentioned it was a big hold your breath after we shipped it. Right. You know, we were kind of later to market than we right. wanted to But be. I mean, we made early decisions <clears throat> in building 10 long before we knew enough about the tape drive to know its total quantity. So it was a tail chasing a horse. But it's also my understanding that 3420 and its predecessors were all standardized and not proprietary to IBM. Right. And to my knowledge, lots of people made those compatible tape drives. It's so you know, I think it was kind of a tradition when the media is removable to enable the interchange and uh, so I don't think anybody questioned it. I only brought it up in the uh, context of... Uh, you said we assigned somebody, was it Volvo? Judd McDowell. Oh, right. McDowell. Judd McDowell to basically... And later on, Paul Sager took over that role, but Judd did it for a long time. There's one more factor in there, and that is we protected that cartridge very closely, highly confidential, you know, even when we had the early beta test sites, we had to go out there and inventory them and keep track of them and all that because we didn't want anybody to know what that form factor was until we announced it, actually shipped it, okay? I mean, so we realized also there was be a lag between when we started and when another vendor could start producing that other 90% or vendors, I should say. So that was another factor. Um, you know, we want to not release any information to the very last minute, and then, whoops, how long does it take the other guy to get up to speed? So there's obvious gap in there. It, it seems that, because I don't remember this part very well, but listening to the conversation of today and yesterday, that we realized when we shipped Sonoida and some testing other people's media, that was really the only one media that was going to work well on our drivers. And if we only had 10% capability of, of the projected volumes, did we do anything to enable our uh, the other vendors to be able to produce a Sonoida type tape so they wouldn't wipe out our drives? 
I, I don't think anybody here can ask the question, but I know that we did a tremendous amount of competitive media analysis, mm -hmm. and I know that we endorsed some and didn't endorse others. I remember there was one particularly bad actor, I forget which one it was, verbatim or somebody, that yeah. was dumping in South America because we recommended so strongly against them. I don't think we gave away the <laughs> no, but, but I think we provided our test capability to give them the feedback they needed to make a product that we could, could sell and yeah. right. Okay, that's, so uh, can we talk a few minutes about library activities in Tucson? Well, to me, we really haven't even started, hardly started the drive discussion. I mean, we can. Well, let me give you a perspective on the drive and then we'll see okay. what we want to do. But certainly there's a, I don't actually think the automation discussion is a very long one. The first thing people see when they look at a 3480 tape drive was where are the vacuum columns? And what's that square card? Because that open reel and those vacuum columns were the, a lot of people thought that was the mainframe. That screwed kind of up truth. The, screwed up the movie people. It was in every single picture. It's the only thing that moves. Right. <laughs> The implication of those simple two observations alone led to years of technical grief. So let me tell you what the vacuum columns were for. That was a mechanical buffer before electronic data buffers were viable, cheap. When the, when the host said, data's coming, you had to be repositioned and ready to take it the minute they got there and you had to take it off. The accelerations of that capstan, and sometimes there was rubber stuff on that capstan to make it grippy. Believe it or not, there was a vacuum in that capstan because we accelerated that tape at 1,000 inches per second squared. That's an enormous acceleration to keep up with the host. 30 Gs? Oh, it's huge. I've, I've heard somebody did a spark on the math and said in a second that would be like here to the moon three times or something. I don't know how far it really is. But, uh, but the mechanical implication of that. So what came along was this concept of an electronic data buffer. It wasn't very large, but it was large enough to buffer enough data to give the 3480 time to reposition because when we got rid of the vacuum columns, all the repositioning was real to real. Those motors were a lot smarter because we wanted the two in one deal. The acceleration got knocked down to 40 inches per second squared in 3480. It went to 15 in Coyote. It went to 10 in LTO. It was, acceleration was bad. And it was, uh, leads right to the next big deal. What happened to the open room? I hope Rick convinced you yesterday that all claims about the life of data on a media, and I don't care whether it's an optical media, a tape media, a disc media, are all completely marketing bogus concepts. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you protect the media environmentally and through handling, uh, that stuff will stay magnetized until the sun explodes. It's that simple. There's no such thing as 70 years or 20 years. Open reel tapes were highly prone to handling damage. In other words, the biggest error mechanism in tape is handling damage, literal damage to the media. Back hitches creating Z folds. People, in fact, when they had threading problems in 3420, they'd just whack off a couple of feet of the tape and rethread it, and then at some point they whack in uh, too far, and all of a sudden you've got a whole unreadable tape. So the whole idea of the cartridge, I'd love to say that IBM was super prescient and was looking forward to enabling automation, but they weren't. It was all about getting the media in a protected environment so that you could eliminate handling as a failure mode. Those two things had enormous consequences. I'll give you a simple example. The 3420 head, recording head, could be changed in a customer office. The tolerances required, now that we didn't have these vacuum columns, we had this reel-to-reel -reel thing, were so difficult that you could no longer replace a head. And we invented something called a head guide through, a head that was attached to two guides that let in and controlled the tape path. And I could go on and on, but the point is just those two observable things alone 
enabled by a small electronic data buffer, caused uh, years of mechanical grief. And there was a lot of, like Al said, a ton of mechanical engineering opportunity in what appears to be an electronics field. There were many other innovations in 3480. Uh, chrome dioxide uh, was a pretty thick coating. It was a fairly high coercivity particle, and we had trouble overriding it. And we would tend to drive the heads beyond the saturation point, typically 110% was our so-called right current, 110% of set current. Because of all the interchangeable, you got weak heads trying to overwrite strong heads, you get all this stuff. And uh, we didn't invent the thin film right head, that came from this land, but we adopted it. We used to drive that with what we call a full cell right driver, so we would have the current all the way plus V until it was minus V, till it was plus V in some modulated fashion to produce the data pattern. And our right head coils were burning out like light bulbs in approximately four hours. So I remember working a night shift once. Uh, I was sharing a, a single track reliability tester at the Grant Building. We only had one or two on the whole site, so time was valuable in these testers. And a guy named Dave Gristle, I was playing around with cleaner blades, a guy named Dave Gristle was playing around with trying to pulse the right current instead of doing a full cell because he was trying to solve the problem of burning out the right heads. And one night he hooked up his cards and I hooked up my cleaner blades and we had been running reliability passes for a long time and one night we'd get an E6 and the next day an E4 and so think of it as soft error rates in your terminology, next day a E5 and the occasional E7, wow. That, that's one error in 10 to the 7th. Yes, one in 10 to the 7th. Uh, so all of a sudden, one magic night, the thing ran stable E7 all night long. And all the, I call them the pointy heads, the McDowell's, the, you know, the senior leadership engineers, uh, you know, Dave and I were just experimenting, came in, what did you guys do? And we said, uh, we looked at each other and said, well, we don't really know what we did. <laughs> we can tell you what we did, but we don't know why. So Dave explained what he was doing. I explained what I was doing. Uh, they all took it away. Uh, Judd McDowell was uh, one of our luminary channel guys, recognized that there was something more than meets the eye here. He did something more than just solve a right burnout problem. He literally assigned Dick Snyder, who was somewhat the junior to Judd at the time, to mathematically look at what Dave was doing and see what it meant. And Dave subsequently, uh, Dick Snyder subsequently wrote the book on right equalization. So that was the birth of right equalization, at least in table. And not only did it solve the burning out of the right problem, but we were driving, in order to overwrite the media, we were driving it so hard that we were creating what they call a second harmonic distortion, nonlinearities off of the MR sensor. Because as you know, the MR sensor has a, a cosine squared response. You try to magnetically bias it so that you're operating here. But when you overdrive it, you'll get rabbit ears on one side and a flat spot on the other. And it's called second harmonic distortion. And it's poison to the channel. The channel can't do anything about it. You can't filter it. And lo and behold, second harmonic distortion was vastly diminished. And thirdly, Dick proved theoretically that you could use variations of these pulses, of which there's an infinite number of ways to go a lot up, a little bit down. You know, you can do all kinds of things with electronics. And he discovered that you could effectively dial in an equalization response that you wanted through the way you wrote the tape to be a very good match for the read channel when it was coming back off the tape. And this is what I call super elegant innovation. Elegant innovation usually occurs, first of all, it's never invented, it's almost always discovered, usually by accident, usually an unintended consequence of solving a completely different problem. It had three gigantic payoffs. It was a first in 3480 innovation. And I just use that as an example of the problems that were presented. And I mean, perhaps I should have prefaced it by saying, why magnetoresistive read it? That was not shipping in DASDI at the time. It was not a proven technology. Well, the 
the other piece of the story on 3420 is that with that gigantic acceleration, you also had very large speeds. Why did you have very large speeds? Because the read sensor in the tape drive was a DVDT sensor. The traditional, literally a wire wound coil. What, you're talking speed. absolute speed or speed variation? Absolute speed. ISVs are all different cam arms. Uh, and we had gotten to a point where the linear density goals we aspired to, uh, we, our signal was just vanishing. And the magnetoresistive sensor, which was not invented but discovered, although many people subsequently patented the discovery, that's just how it works, was speed independent. Wow, just what tape needed. Disc wasn't worried. They could still keep cranking that RPM. The tape was out of gas, particularly on this new platform. And we originally started it with no pneumatics, by the way, uh, our eyes wide and shut. <laughs> so that's uh, so the magnetoresistive and uh, this right of equalization thing to all to address this absence of vacuum columns. Uh, tomorrow, I think Dan Minarski will tell you a little bit more about the evolution of the mechanical deck. I did work on it. As I mentioned, we started without uh, pneumatics and we had terrible problems. We had headwear problems, but we also had guide bearing wear problems that were severe. It was damaging tapes, particularly on the edges. It was leaving all kinds of crap in the tape path. Whereas uh, Nick D'Onofrio used to say, shit on the head. <laughs> it's a technical term. Dazzy probably had the same term. I think we use crap. But. Okay. The other thing that was really bad, this was a horrible consequence. Uh, Joel may or may not remember this, because this was not a technology problem. In theory, by the way, this was the first microprocessor controlled real to real servo system that we had ever done. When you think about the servo system on the 3420, you got this reel keeping that column in tape, this reel watching that column, and a cap stand in the middle. That is a very primitive control system when you think about it. It's child's play. Now we had to go to this real real thing. Now, in theory, you could uh, dead wreck in position get pretty close through counting tacks. You could estimate the radius of the two packs and do reasonably good tension control, but you couldn't do quite good enough tension control. So you had tension transients that would affect head wear, tape damage, other things. So we had to put something called a tension transducer in the tape path. We'd never done this in a tape drive before. Uh, that was probably 20 people in a task force that lasted for three years under Tom Monster Day. I remember the pain of it. Very painful. So I'm just showing you the ripple down effect of just a couple of little things that look kind of obvious become huge areas of invention required on a schedule and uh, drives a lot of work. Those I, I've got other examples I sent you in an email. I don't have the email in front of me, but those were a couple that I think were in there. Uh, by the way, on the cleaner blade, it turns out the Grant Building was undergoing uh, some uh, renovation, some construction. And I thought I had really contributed to this 87 night, you know, Dave was part of it, but I got, I got, I got a piece of that. So I analyzed uh, the debris that I had captured in a screen in the vacuum uh, line of my cleaner blade. And it came back 100% gypsum dust floating in the ambient atmosphere due to construction in the cafeteria somewhere. Now, our tape was not backcoated, and uh, because there was no tradition of backcoating tapes, uh, I was a strong proponent of backcoat, but, uh, you know, if you, Dr. Bradshaw didn't agree with you in those days, it didn't happen. The consequence of that is that we had uh, humongous amounts of static electricity that would build up throughout the tape path. We had uh, precautions in the head to bleed it away. We had precautions throughout the tape path to bleed it away. And that gypsum dust was just landing on the tape on certain nights when it was bad. And that, that was probably more responsible for the E4 one day and the E6 the next than anything else. Yeah. Uh, I went ahead and patented it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a question from someone who's not so familiar with technology. I thought tape in the half inch reel to reel was quite commonly back coated with carbon. Not at the time. No. We had no back coat at all on, on our medias. 
Oh, really? I'm yeah. not saying other industries didn't do it. IBM didn't do it. It was not a tradition, to my knowledge, uh, since 1952. Earlier, take drugs. Really? I did become a common practice later on. Now, at some point, Dr. Bradshaw did buy in because he recognized that there was a stress uh, balancing that could be achieved. Uh, but that was after we left the media business that uh, we became a fan and we were working with 3M. I don't honestly remember if 3590 was back coded or not. It probably was, but I don't know. I'd have to go look. To answer your question, okay. no, it was not the practice. And static electricity, frankly, had never been an issue in 3420. It didn't have the components that were uh, as uh, like the MR head that were so that could be damaged. Yeah. Again, it's my ignorance. Yeah. I just had, I have a recollection of uh, carbon coating being fa fairly common. I thought that Memorex and things like Black Watch at Scotch, but it might I, have been. But we didn't do. I'm it. just. Yeah, I think we. It's just a fact. I know. <laughs> okay. I, I'm. I'll tell you why I know we didn't do. It. So I had a brilliant idea. I wasn't going to bring this up, but this is on the tape deck design. So we had a deal, we, we came off a reel, went over a bearing, over the head, over another bearing, it came back around a tension transducer and back onto the other reel. And it made for a semi-elegant uh, threading mechanism, uh, kind of a cammed thing, you know, you know, took the leader block out and stuck it in the take-up reel inside. And we were having all these problems, and uh, especially on the guide bearings, and I had this brilliant idea of flipping the head over onto the other side and turning the tape inside out. Now, I'm an associate engineer. You would think that I would have been completely blown off on that suggestion, but I'll be damned if everybody didn't jump on it and do it. So now we had to thread over a bearing, back over the head, over the bearing, and there was something called a laugh track threader that was like a choo-choo train that did that. And the first thing, and we did that without even experimenting. I honestly thought that there would be 14 smart guys that would review this before we just went and tried it. Uh, it was a colossal waste of money. It was my fault. And uh, that mylar, uncoated mylar, stuck to those non-pneumatic air bearings like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> the drag and the tape, that was horrible. It was so bad we would snap tape when we were trying to accelerate. So we put the head back on the other side, <laughs> put the old threader back on, and uh, that's how I know that we did not have a back of the media because I experienced it. Uh, I finally concluded that we needed to put pneumatics in the tape drive, and that idea met a lot of resistance. Pneumatics are not all that reliable, they're noisy, money, money. But I wrote a memo, I proved it, I designed the air bearings, we put them in the product, and it turns out we needed air for lots of other reasons that we didn't know we needed air for. We needed a vacuum on a cleaner blade that went in later. Believe it or not, our stiction problems were so bad between the head and the tape that in between the two head modules, we put a, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, uh, it was called a tape lifter, but it was, a, it was an air, pneumatic air guide so that when the tape was stopped, we would actuate high pressure between the modules and lift the tape off the head. Because that's how paranoid we were, particularly when the tape was at rest for a long time and some environmental stress. Uh, it was so bad you could pull a 3480 tape drive across the room by grabbing the tape and stuck to the head. Give me that thing. And, and Rick talked a lot about these problems yesterday. It was mainly associated with what we called the Pegasus Media before Rick's Sonoido formulation became available. And I'm going to take exception with one thing with Andy, and I'm, I don't, I'm not, don't mean this at all critically, but in fact, and in hindsight it might have been an error, uh, we did ship 3480 without Rick Bradshaw, not because of him. We shipped Pegasus because brick stuff wasn't ready. We shipped 17 million cartridges of Pegasus before Rick's formulation was ready for prime time, and we got 12 million of those back <laughs> in something like the first 18 months of the program. They did talk about that somewhat okay. yesterday, when you were playing golf probably. But uh, 
I was they, they, they talked about it being like a nine million. So it's actually yeah. like seventeen million. You got twelve. Million I remember million. seventeen. Yeah, and you probably remember right. I remember but I mean, that's I was in I was in management by then. Right. So right. I was kind of in yeah. tune with the business as well as the time. Right. Yeah. Don't have my notes. Uh, these guys can chip in. There's a lot of other technical war stories that are kind of interesting. Um, we covered a lot of that. Yesterday. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So, so just uh, what you could observe was uh, a significant challenge for them. Uh, Actually, we sort of covered stick, well, stiction in great depth. My from guess is you were focused on the heads. And I uh, was focused really, on the media. I was really, we never, I don't think we use the word head but oh, okay. to speak of. So, Well, the we real stiction uh, problem is with the heads. And stiction. And but it doesn't matter which. The point is we've covered it. Yesterday. So now you know the motivation and what the ramifications are. Yeah. Uh, John was talking about the, the the technology advances that actually were key to be able to do the product. And this, this is going to be kind of a question that I'm asking these two guys. Um, Boulder time frame, the product comes down here, we've got a new plant site, and probably a new crew are being, being hired because you don't move everybody down when those transfers happen. So there are so a lot of you know new people come on board, new, et cetera. But, the Saguaro was pro was probably in our product projections at the time, 1980 time frame, uh, and um, the um, commitments or the technology, I'll call it advances that were required. How many how many of these were committed at that time? In in not committed per se, but it, an assumption like the MR head was it an assumption? I know I know that the buffer had to be to get rid of the, right. get rid of the thing. And, but it's like the MR head. Was it one that was assumed? I, it, it was, was the there chrome dioxide? Because yeah. we knew we had the velocity problem. And the chrome dioxide was requirement? Well, and, and in theory, the uh, the thin film head, both the magnetoresistive and the inductive side, could be deposited on a much harder material than the traditional metal head, typically a calcium titanate or some type of ceramic, right. which we thought would give us some improvement in terms of the wear characteristics. Right. What we didn't know was how incredibly abrasive chrome dioxide media was. But a lot, one, yeah. I'm sorry, but building 10 in its design was designed around chromium dioxide. Right? Oh, it was? Yeah. So uh, he, he was saying, well, what was assumed and then what was oh, sort of uh, right. so not in the plan. And th this is very typical. Of the but we assumed chrome particle, we assumed MR head, yeah. we assumed no pneumatics, although that turned out to be not true. It, it, you know, this is very typical of the, of the development process. As you other gentlemen have been involved in development ahead would know. You, you, the management teams have to be able to commit to what they think is achievable to be able to put together a product that has, you know, the capacities, the costs, et cetera. So that's why I was asking why I assume, I kind of assumed that the MR head was probably part, part of that. The, the, at that time it was called Pegasus Media mm -hmm. uh, and maybe a, a different name but Manchi or some name like that well, before. Sinoid, but, oh yeah, so, yeah but, probably. But, you, when you, but they committed to build a facility that was going to be able to build that based on what the engineering team said they could do. The type of problems that you get then during the development process are really uh, basically the execution of what the commitments were. And, and the inventions that are required are significant to be able to really get there. And, and I think that's what you know, it's typical of every development, but, but I think 3480 was unique in some way. It was not incremental in any way, really. No, uh, no. It was, it was a complete, you know, jump forward on what kind of, you know, uh, approach was going to be used. And another piece of that, while well, all this technology is going on, we're moving people from mostly Boulder, some San Jose, and a couple other sites into Tucson. So you have not only the work environment of new people trying to work together, I've never worked with this guy before, what's he like? And, you know, new hires. New hires, and all of that in parallel with people's personal life of, gee, I just had to buy a house, my kid's got to be in some new school, uh, I got to find a new doctor or dentist in this town, and, and all of the personal side were all going on all at the same time. And you know, we talk about developing a product, and yes, there's all the technical aspects of it and the wear and tear on the individual to make it happen. Whether you're 
in product tests all night long in your, your, your underwear or whatever it may be, but all of these, not all, but many of these people had a personal side they were dealing with in parallel. And, and I don't think that should be overlooked from the viewpoint of how things happen. You can't, when you go home at night, you know, you can't divorce yourself from work. And when you go to work in the morning, you can't divorce yourself from family. So, you know, they're intertwined. And, and I think that was a, a very interesting piece of it all going on at the same time. Yeah, that was the management challenge for my senior management because I was just part of that mix. Uh, back to Al's thing, I've now lived through a whole bunch of product cycles, shipped a whole bunch of products, had a few failures. A lot of them were baby out with a bathwater brand new, a lot of them were just incremental. Al's exactly right. You, you start with about three or four assumptions that are usually driven by the requirements. So I'm pretty sure in 3480 that chromium dioxide was an assumption because of a coercivity requirement to support a linear density line. I'm pretty sure the EMR head was a requirement because of the reduced velocity that we wanted to achieve in the real-to-real -real system. But what I learned many times over and over in my career is uh, that what you tend to get bit by, by is uh, what you didn't know. We didn't know the issues with thin film riders and magnetoresistives and the impact that would have to the circuitry and the channel. Uh, just so many things that we didn't know. Didn't know the you, you mentioned ISVs when we talked about instantaneous speed variations because it really mocked us. One thing we didn't know because it, because vacuum columns were this wonderful buffer from whatever was in that reel. We didn't care because vacuum columns buffered. Now they're gone. Here's what we found out. We found out that when you wind a tape on a cartridge in a factory, that it is full of residual stress. Some of that is what we call hoop stress, and some of that is what we call radial stress. But it's loaded with stress. Um, in fact, when you look at a roll of toilet paper, you'll see that the inside cardboard thing is often quite misshapen. That's the accumulation of that, what, well, what we call winding stress. And then these winding stresses will come out in a cartridge, and then we might expose them to a thermal stress. We might expose them to a mechanical stress. So we had been doing this thermal stuff and sticking this stuff in a drive and all of a sudden uh, experiencing a lot of permanent errors. You go, wait a minute, that's not a soft error. What the hell is this? Because what could happen is that you could have, this ISV was basically a shock wave going at the speed of sound in Mylar. And, and there was this phased relationship. That did acceleration. And occasionally you could write something that had a yeehaw in it that would sneak through the read side and not get caught on your read after break. And then you'd subsequently try to read that tape another time, and all of a sudden you got something that was written dead right. And it's all the tracks. You couldn't recover like you can from deep. And we're like, so I got assigned to go try to help figure out what was going on. And part of my problem was that the my ability to turn experiments around was limited by this 12 hours I had to wait for the, the thermal cycle to create the effect. And one day I accidentally dropped a cartridge on the floor. Oops, picked it up, shoved it in the drive, and I had all the ISVs I could possibly want. I didn't even need that thermal cycle to <laughs> create this problem. And, uh, that was cool, because now I can really get a lot of data in a hurry. All I got to do is bang the cartridge on the end of the table and stick it in the machine. So the, the thermal cycle was causing the... It was just another uh, stress reduction mechanism. It was just reducing like, the stress. Remember I said thermal or mechanical, there were probably yeah. other stresses that might have caused it. It turns out that it was pretty much invisible to the channel when it happened, and we ended up putting a special IV detector looking specifically for the signature of that yeehaw, I called it a yeehaw, you probably have a direct delta function name for it or something. And, uh, and the ISV detector would go off and say, uh, hey, you better rewrite that block. You know, it would create a, a soft error, you know, force a rewrite or something like that. So we didn't solve the problem. We didn't know how to solve it. We tried a few things. Uh, I won't go into what they were because so, we didn't so do it. The ISV turned out to be a mechanical separation 
causing a hard, accident. causing a right error. Yeah. So, so I mean, so the, but, the but flux cases, did not. But in some cases, the right error was undetectable, and that was what was so bad yeah. about. Well, this you topic. can't you can't detect the right error. And not correct. Yeah, you can't detect the right error until you read. Well, well we, we always did read, read after. right after. We sure, always we do read, read after. Well, right. We're not like this. We're we're, no. we're after reliable. I understand. Okay. Thank you, John. He I spent a life getting sand kicked in my face. No, it's my turn. Was that a? Uh, no, that was a tradition in tape since 1952. Sure, no. uh, oh. DIS had the ability. It's called a turn on write verify. It costs you a revolution of latency. Yeah. Just I turned it on in all of my home computers, but a lot of people okay. didn't, either didn't know it existed, yeah. or they didn't want the latency because it is a significant latency. Uh, no, it it does have a serious performance. Absolutely. Issue, but the so so the point is there could be this. Remember the distance between the write gap and the read gap creates something called a spatial filter. Of course. So you got a yeehaw over here that's got a fair amount of frequency content. Some of that frequency content is going to be an integral uh, number of that distance, and it won't get caught. Okay. Kind of weird. I, I'm probably not describing no, it very well. Just right the way you read but it, the point is, it was possible to write something that was incorrectly written. It wasn't caught when it was written, and it will cause a subsequent because because harmon error. because okay. harmonically it's a the, harmonic thing. The 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 red transition appears to be good. But yeah, it's we really call not it there. A, yeah, yeah, we call it a spatial filter, and uh, it's been a long time. But I was giving you an example because you brought it up. So this was another consequence of vacuum columns used to kind of separate all, keep all that crap away from us. And if it happened, it was usually it didn't make it all the way up to the head. But in this case, it did. So, so you'd add cash, wouldn't you, to one of the three major assumptions? Oh, the cash was an assumption, and I, I assumed that that was. Here's the one of the most interesting things about 3480. Uh, listening to Joel over there. With all this pain that we yes. were talking about that we described, 3480 did not Probably move the football very speed. far down the field. We went from 160 megabytes to 200 megabytes. We went from one and a quarter megabytes per second to three. For the technology investment we made, that wasn't a lot of yardage down the field. And this was in a day and age where what 3480 really was Forget about intelligent business plans. Forget about this was an end of life replacement product for 3420. The capacity requirement was originally 160 megabytes when I arrived because they wanted to make sure a 3420 tape could be copied onto the new cartridge. That was the only requirement. These days, you couldn't do a business case for a technology investment that doesn't move the football in order of magnitude down the field, you know. And uh, that was what was always amazed me about 3480 was the investment IBM was willing to make to simply replace 3420. 3420 was fraught within the life parts. Uh, this is hard for me, even me to believe, but when I joined IBM in 1978, I got drug into a factory somewhere on a motor task force. And I said, what, we make our own motors? And somebody said, we designed our own motors. Paul well, who's got 18 million motor patents? design their own motors? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so the end of life issues on 3420 plus its uh, nagging reliability and head replacement rate in the field because as it aged, uh, sweet old Bob Riley had this brilliant idea of increasing the tension in all the vacuum columns to improve the soft air rates. Just pull that damn tape harder on that head. Six months after he released a field bill to do that, we just got, well, got about 75,000 worn out heads back. <laughs> and then we went to Montpelier, I remember, uh, we uh, flame sprayed a zirconia oxide. And there's one, help. I hated chemistry by the way, there's one column on there that has alumina, hafnia, zirconia, there's a whole bunch of these elements that when you put them in oxides they're quite hard. And uh, we were able to flame spray it on top of the head without affecting the magnetic uh, performance. And the point is, 3420, maintaining it was probably getting to be as expensive as funding the 3480 technology. 
which was not cheap. Well, it was a cost effect. It was a cost to the customer too. So part of the business case is going to be just if you can place the drives that are out there, you're going to make money on those, those drives, and then you have the media. And there was a lot of performance and uh, mainly I call it, I call it maintenance costs reductions that the customers would see. So over over, I think there was a lot of justification. A product just based on, just on that you know, yeah. without having yeah, right. to be a capacity because we had a largely a lease model in fact i gave yeah. our joel yeah. the history of take drive pricing up through but not including 3480 it's all lease numbers <laughs> and so in other words that was a cost idea yeah. you talk about That's we right. didn't move the football down football. the field very far which technologically yeah and I, I obviously i agree with you but i think part of the motivation of the 3480, as far as its size and style and all the rest, was yes, we had all the problems with 3420s, that's for sure. And at the same time, we had a lot of competitors who were making 3420 like looking boxes, STC and all the rest. So part of it was if we're going to do something to replace the 3480, it got to look different. Okay, that was a very, sure. I remember talking about that many times over, and out of that, it's got to look different, okay, was, we said, what are the props? Well, squeezing the reel and the human handling of the big reel, the size of the reel and the, you know, what it took to get that reel moving, okay? All the tape columns, not only they're great debris collectors, those tape columns, but then we had to use a cleaning fluid to clean them, which wasn't in, uh, it's the same stuff, uh, dry cleaning fluid, uh, mm -hmm. tetra, help me with the word, whatever Sorry. word. And, and, you know, at that point in time, that had a bad name as far as the environment and all the rest goes. So all these things came together that, yes, we got to replace the 3480, yes, it has problems, and we don't, we want it to look different for multiple reasons, okay? So a lot of that thinking was get it to look different more so than move the football down the field. In other words, that factor well. started to override the factor of let's just have a major technology breakthrough. Another factor that I can inject here is that it gave us a base for extendability, which we didn't have. Right. That we mentioned yesterday. That right? gives us the extendability of higher capacities and data rates. Uh, we, we didn't aggressively pursue it, though. The march up Moore's Law back in the day, first of all, we didn't even know what Moore's Law was, and we didn't care. And when I first heard it, I didn't believe it anyway. I thought that's armchair science. But, I mean, 160 to 200, and that took years. Well, believe it or not, we did not even increment the platform for another six years. We doubled it. Now, that's not Moore's Law. No, it's not Moore's Law. And uh, just as a footnote, but I agree with you. I think what it was is we were trying to protect a business, right. and we need we badly needed a replacement product, right. and there really wasn't a large technical driver there because, as I mentioned, customers weren't complaining about capacity. We didn't know why they weren't, and we discovered they only wrote 20 megs on those things. And, and, and you know that 20 megs on a <coughs> reel, I remember back from 729 days, that was an equally true statement. They never filled up a reel of tape. Okay, I I mean, that, and you talk about chopping off the first end of the tape, you know, you run it to the end, flip it over, and then you start from the other end, okay, and you keep chopping off more and more. So, I mean, nobody ever used up the full reel of tape. They only used a small mark in the front. Let's talk about why that was true, by the way, because uh, this tape applications has evolved and changed dramatically over time. Tape was part of the data processing operation in the enterprise for many years. They did uh, actual database sort merge. They did all kinds of actual jobs on tape that are handled by disk today. Because it was not dominated by backup and it was not dominated by archive, which do fill tapes. The concept of backup and archive didn't, and big data evolved much later. So, so we weren't driven by technology, so to speak. We were driven by reliability and performance. We needed to get faster, but not necessarily bigger. And that's where the 20 megabits comes from. That was a typical uh, 
mainframe job or maybe a typical database size of, a, of something like a social security, something or, or census. Something. And it was when all of this big data and internet and everything that I talked about that made Quantum King, it probably wasn't until the mid-90s that capacity became king and everybody tried to get on that Morse curve. And so today if you did that survey, you'd probably find all the whole it's all, length of the tape it's all is, filled it is filled, and we're no longer. There have been a number of published studies that show that you, know, you have 120, 1,200 feet, and it's maybe only the first 10 feet used. One of the advance, advantages or advances that we made was the solid state buffer. That was I, of, I am of, assuming that. I, I, I wasn't I'm there. there. I'm assuming, but I don't know how else we could do right. it. Right. Uh, I assume that was kind of part of the 3480 product design and such. But I did notice, and I'm kind of getting prepared for this, that we announced in about a year before that, we announced one of the 34, uh, the, the real or real type, uh, with a solid state buffer. Uh, one of the products that we had. Did you, did you remember that part? No. It was a, it, it's a, it was a tape product with a buffer. Oh, you know what? Um, let me slightly digress, because I think you might be right. But here, let me tell you what happened. There were flavors of compatible 3420 tape drives coming out without vacuum columns. So other people went a different route. Yeah. Okay. Preserve, so if you remember Sunfish, they were kind of, oh, the size of an oven and uh, you'd set yes. it on top or maybe yes. it was slightly slanted. Right. Well, clearly that did not have the acceleration characteristics of the 3420. My guess is there are people who took the solid state memory and instead of going our new baby, new bathwater route that 3480 was, they just said, well, let's keep making 3420 compatibles and just use a piece of this. Yeah, we, we announced some, absolutely some, right. some product. We did work with Fujitsu. And I think it was in 1983. I think it was Sunfish, and we did it with Sun, Fujitsu. Okay. Yeah. That's what it was. I so I thought maybe that, that was a spin-off of some of the technology act activities that were going on. It was an alternative. It was an alternative way of protecting our base, but I guess... Yeah. Uh, I don't know how the decision was made to continue 3480. I wasn't part of it, but it's a good observation. Yeah. So, so obviously the deck, the problem is that when you think about 3420, it was a 1952 wheelbase, right? And it had not been evolved for my goodness 30 years before we finally replaced it. So my guess is solid state buffers were around a long time. We just didn't pick them up for because we didn't need them. Never married the didn't technology. Need them. Yeah. So, so the concept of caching actually was proven. The concept of not needing to I the mechanical you. isolator was shown to work on the sunfish type of product, perhaps yeah. by your competitors. I but guarantee you, they didn't invent it. I'm just saying it was something out there, probably for some completely other purpose, maybe even nothing to do with storage. We just knew it was there and we needed it, and it solved a big problem. Mm -hmm. You mentioned an, an ISV, an instantaneous. Uh, Speed variation detector, how'd you do that? I don't remember, Judd McDowell did it. He put yeah. some kind of differentiator on, uh, I, don't, I don't even, I don't know how to do it, Andy might know. You would have to detect it, and then you were able to uh, uh, retry. If, if it force a retry. Yeah, force a retry. And, or a rewrite. And, and it was just, just looking at the, at the signal, or the uh, uh, spacing between the transitions, and, and you could tell very easily, based on the clock code that we had, uh, recording code that we had, and those were unallowed transitions. So they got to the point to where the timing was not recognizable okay. in terms of what we were trying to write. So here's the rest it was, of it. It was, it, was, it was a fairly dramatic speed variation because our, our PLO, our, our phase lock, you know, synchronization with the data, uh, it was out of whack with that. So it, it was detectable. In, in that so, so, so the funny part of that story is Judd came up with this idea. Judd was always the guy getting awards who used to make fun of him. We got an award for the damn idea. We thought it was kind of an obvious idea, but whatever. And uh, Judd was Judd, right? That was perfect. Hi, Judd, in case you're out there. Um, and then we got it out in the field, and we had a lot of false detections, a lot of forced rewrites that didn't need to be rewrites, some performance impact. Uh, there came a point in time on 3590 where Judd took the ISV detector out and got another award for it. I kid you not. We made a movie for his quarter century club where we 
mercilessly satired all of the awards Jeff got. And you know, he's God and all that stuff. So was it really necessary? I don't, I don't know. It was more I mean, of an overkill. It was, it was probably an overkill. My guess is the channel caught 18, you know, 99.999 percent of them, and this one that got away was a very rare event, and probably even a. But the problem is, we were the enterprise, and the enterprise, the biggest sin you can commit is to corrupt data and not know you did it. That's the biggest sin. Then you can corrupt data and know you did it and send up a big red flag, rerun the job. So there's a lot of lesser sins that are permissible. Mm -hmm. But when it came to what we call permanent data loss that you didn't know about, that is that is almost a situation that can create a liability. A customer can can yeah. do the bartender who served argument, and that was the problem with some version of Lotus where two plus two didn't equal four. You know, when you discover these types of issues internally in your product testing, and, and we we found many. It all of a sudden went, need to know, hush, 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 circle the wagons, alert the lawyers, have we shipped any of these, have we, you know, it became a big deal. You probably remember some of these things as they, they occurred. And, uh, and we had our share on 3480 and on just about every tape product I've worked on, we had yeah. some flavor of that sound. And I think the same thought process applies to Enterprise DASD also. Sure I mean, mm -hmm. he's, thou that, shall not. But that was a big part of the reason why we couldn't scale down later in our business life, because we had this thing so hardened, so bulletproof, we had so much cost in it, that we just could not take it down market. You couldn't attach it to a Unix server. Unix, they're just backing mm -hmm. stuff up, and all hell if you yesterday's backup is no good, we'll use the day befores or tomorrow's, or we don't care. You know, it was a whole different environment. So, so, so I've written down seven now key assumptions about the 3480 that came to Tucson probably. Uh, chromium dioxide, right from the beginning. MR heads, right from the beginning. With a with separate inductive writer, of course. Cash. Um, orders of magnitude improvements in what IBM, I think, calls UI or did call UI unscheduled incidents or scheduled incidents. I mean, what we talked about yesterday uh, in a reel-to-reel -reel tape drive, cleaning or cleaning the system three times a day, replacing heads X times a, a month, or, you know, to no, you, uh, no scheduled maintenance and five years life on the head. You know, that, that's really pushing the football down a different field. Yeah, that's uh, called product speak, and us technologists don't even know what a UI is, and we don't care. Uh, <laughs> but all of, that's all of the things you just mentioned come under my heading of reliability from a customer's viewpoint. Right. I'd also had 180, 180 megabytes as the because you had to be bigger than the prior right. reel, but and I think it was 160. And uh, 160? I'm what sorry. I think I'm not sure. Yeah, 160. Yeah, and a half inch reel. And you had to be, and you were going to be a cartridge which directly supported the the uh, improvement in reliability and, and uh, usability. Uh, so uh, you know, 3480, uh, I'm sorry, 3420 was not that reliable. So we right. had to come out with a product that really made the point about reliability. Okay, and you know whether it's. it's the permanent error thing, or the cleaning, or the handling, all those things come under this big umbrella that the customer can see from an improved reliability viewpoint. And that mm -hmm. was a very key factor, you know, of why I should buy it, you know, and I think that was a major selling point. Even floor, floor space for the storage, and the wheels and the cartridges, and the water yeah. size. Uh, and, uh, the, the, times the size. More efficient yeah. handling by yeah. operators. Uh, the uh, you guys have any recollection of reliability plus in that time frame? Yeah. Were they much. remember the reliability? Plus. I remember the two. that's other people checking this out. Yeah, is that a driver in this in this issue at all? Not we, we did uh, our own. But in terms of the. The UI, the uh, 
and you know what, whatever term you want to use, MTBF or UI. Yeah. You know, in terms of those objectives, uh, reliability plus took IBM's ERP, ERP, error reporting, mm -hmm. and turned it into a report. A, a, a report on everybody in the industry, Memorex, IBM, yeah, SDK, and you know, and all of a sudden there was this perhaps not such a uh, uh, insightful measure of the products, but all of a sudden you were getting so many hard errors per megabyte transferred, or you know, or head crowd, or you know, this, and this really caused a focus in the industry, at least at my point, from Memorex's viewpoint, there was all of a sudden an incredible focus on uh, how do we improve our, how do, how do we improve our reliability plus numbers. numbers. The first answer was the numbers are, are baloney, we don't believe them, but then the customers believe them, so we were driven on the FISC side. I was just curious as to whether you saw that there here. Was, there was that kind of pressure inside, but I don't think it drives any of the product specifications or requirements per se. It becomes then an assumption that later, when you're out in the field, you better be you better be top notch. I mean, because because that was it there at that time. I, I recall, but you also remember probably that same time frame. Crosby quality it was just oh, a yeah. tremendous uh, uh, drive towards improved quality. I think there was something going on from Japan. There was a there was a quality measurement. Deming. De yeah. It was Deming, right? He went over Deming. there and worked with the Jeff six, 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 six Sigma. Yeah, six, that six, stuff yeah. was all on top of program management and. And, and, and hire that program management. They all knew there was that pressure. And I mean, I went to the quality school of management, you know, at Crosby in Florida. And you may have too, I don't know, but I mean, you, know, you did. So we, we, the management was, we were pushing quality, and, and the result of that is, is improvements in the products. So there, you know, you can't separate them uh, through that process. Quality, that reliability plus, I remember it. As you do. <laughs> it was painful for me because uh, I was re responsible for, for the double density 3350 at that time, and it right. was painful. Right. Um, you didn't do TMR studies as well. Because we, we, <laughs> we knew you couldn't do double density in 3850. That's why we did 3375. Yeah, I sure proved you wrong on that one. No, you, uh, you said you had your problems. No, you, we gave you an opening by the delays on the 3380. It yes. wasn't because we did 3375. Yeah. Uh, so, so we talked about some of the inherent things and then the uh, surprises that cause invention. We talked about several of the inventions, uh, right equalization, uh, the ISV detection, which may or may not have been an invention, uh, the lifter, I guess, to lift the... The load uh, mechanism probably itself was probably yeah. invention. You said that the, it was the load block work. was. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the others that uh, are memorable challenges? Uh, you know, to getting uh, it out or to doing tomorrow, it. Tomorrow, Dan Winarski is going to be able to help you a lot with that because he was very much in yeah. the middle of the implementation and the day -to -day. He'll remember better. He was on the product side. I was on the technology side, so I kind of remember the the technical challenge, but not necessarily the. Invention required in loaders and threaders. And you know, one, of, one of the things that goes on in these type of products, especially when there's so much writing on so it, was, 34A is monstrous in that, uh, investment, right? Is is the involvement of upper management and its and its impact on the team. I mean, uh, besides being stomped on on your foils on a different product, we had. Bertram down here, uh, Dr. Bertram was our, our president after Anderson, probably brought in because he was a hard-nosed guy that was going to drive the hell out of us. And uh, we, we, I, I mentioned that, you know, he, said he, he was able to withstand all of the management changes, which, which is a, a quality that allowed him then to do this, uh, this West Press, I guess. But, um, you know, Mazda moved on because of the pressures of the upper management. But Rosado moved on, you know, in their own ways. There's a stubbornness that, that involves a lot of the type of interaction between top-level uh, top managers. But Ger Bertram brought in new management. He was here every week. He brought in Gus Vassilides. He brought in Hassan, who I'm not sure why, but he brought in Hassan. And his and, and, and then, of course, oh, we had Harry's and, and behind us every every Jack day. Harker came every well, but Harker, but Harker was a soft guy, relative. He was, 
you know, he was, you know, he was a guy that, you know, probably gave feedback. But Harry's was kind of, Harry's was not the kind of guy that you wanted on your back. Bertram was a, a guy that, you know, you, you, you didn't want to go in and report every week, but we did. So there's a, there was, I mean, every week we were in there. You know. No problem. Yeah, no problem, right. But uh, every Tuesday morning. Yeah. And, and we had no smoking, you know, in, at our facility. Except, and, for, except for except for except for Vassalotti's and, and Bertram Bert. cigars. <laughs> but anyway, you know, just driving the program room was what roughly this size, a little maybe bit bigger a little, than this, little bit bigger than yeah. this, jam packed with people. Okay, I mean, you no place to sit. Guys standing house. around the outside. Those two guys smoking cigars. The room got this blue haze <laughs> over it. Okay, I mean. It, I walk. I used to go home at night. And my wife would go, "Dude, you smell like you know you, you all that smoke and getting your clothing and like that." So, and, and, and during those days, it wasn't just development that was under the gun. Uh, manufacturing was already producing and having to go through yields, you know, and, and, and your yields on your on your H, on the medias, and so there was a significant pressure. And you know, Bertram's come down from San Jose. Harry's come down from San Jose, and you know, and. Uh, you know, and he brought Bosslotti's in, and so his Bosslotti's was a Bertram guy. I don't think Rosado was a Bertram guy. No. Mazza was a Rosado guy, so all of a sudden we lose two guys. And they, these two guys are guys that I was involved with quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, you know, the, the, the Bertram, Bosslotti's, Hassan of environment was not the easiest management structure to, to work through. Especially well, only when you look to the direction thing. If you did, then you're okay. So I wanted to mention one more technical thing that was interesting. It was, it was a direct consequence of removing vacuum columns that we didn't know. It's called a tension gradient. Tension gradient. So across the half inch width of tape with vacuum columns, that tension was uniformly distributed because it has to be. Because a vacuum is a vacuum. Does it do it? Equalizes, of course. Unfortunately, when you get rid of those vacuum columns, you now have bearings that are tilted different ways. You have distortions in the tape that come from the factory. You might have some uh, distortions in the cartridge reel that was wound on. And we had a lot of problems. Again, as sort of an indirect consequence of no vacuum columns, with something called tension gradients, where we would have edge track problems where the tape might be flying higher than it is on the other side, and we actually had a way to measure it and do all kinds of stuff to it. Um, we had serious edge wear problems, severe. And we were using something called a uh, center tab shunt biased magnetoresistive head. This people would not even acknowledge that as a magnetoresistive head because uh, to them, if the, the uh, bias layer needs to be infused into the nickel iron layer that's called a soft bias head and that's a real head to them but we literally had a separate layer adjacent to the nickel iron layer we'd run a separate current through it to create the bias magnetic field uh, in the layer of interest hmm. and it was center tapped and the cool thing about the center tap was for free you got something called common mode noise rejection the problem is that when you severely wore an edge track it because of tension gradients, it wore at an angle. So half of the EMR became shorter, and you degraded your CMRR, and we had premature failures due to really not a whole lot of wear. But now we had a dead track, and pretty soon we might have two dead tracks. Big problem. Armies of people, huge infrastructure, and life testing, wear testing, start stop, streaming environmental wear, uh, just another flavor of an unintended, what we didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know. We covered that to some extent. Okay. Yeah, actually, well, there's uh, a media perspective on it, but then there was the impact. Yeah. The head design yeah. that corrected it. So. All right. Yeah, was that a head design correction or a... Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it turns out it was never totally solved. We, uh, but we did implement tension gradient testing. We implemented it in the, in the media plant to ensure that we weren't producing too much, but we also uh, implemented in the drive to make sure we were aligning components correctly. And, you know, yeah, there was it sounds like a, a tape guide. But the head was the head, and it was still undercut. There was a, a, an MR strike.
So before we switch to a discussion of automation, is one last pass at are there any other innovations that oh, so, that solve significant problems you'd like to mention in terms of the failure, you know, failure effect and, and failure mode. I think we're going to have a chance to uh, sleep on it, and okay. we're going to be back on the air with Dan Monarski tomorrow, and I think that's going to stimulate some more that's memories, I suspect. Good point. Good point. So I think we can uh, rest our case on the 3480 tape drive for the time being. There perhaps is one thing that, that never gets mentioned that needs to get mentioned. Tape drives were actually pretty dumb in those days. 3480 was an analog interface. It had very little actual, if not zero, channel intelligence in it. It had an automatic gain control to control that output to the controller. Electronics was very expensive in those days. And we would amortize the cost of electronics over a, what we called a string of drives. And there was a whole body of science there called a controller. Now, a modern controller is not a very intelligent device. It's almost just a glorified switch with some CRC function and some uh, protocol uh, translation. A modern day controller is not that interesting. But back then, the whole recording channel was in there, all the data detection, all of the ECC embedding, uh, all the handshaking, of course, with the uh, whatever the interfaces were. I don't know. I never worked on controllers, but I know that there are people. I know that that was a significant part of the 3480 story, and I know very little about it. Maybe you guys do. I, I know very little. I think that was the Rick. Well, part of the and uh, yeah. Kirby Dommens, and I, I don't know. Yeah, who I, Harley, Harley worked on it, and uh, his team. Um, I get asleep on it, as John would say. So maybe tomorrow, uh, maybe Rick Conway will finally call me back, and I'll just kind of invite him ad hoc, and we can maybe do some sure. ad hoc. Yeah, the things you. But I wanted to acknowledge that there's this whole yeah, thing that we have. So, so the things you need to think about, SASD controllers being pretty very similar. We only have one head reading or writing at a time, so we have only one data separator. Uh, issues then in data separation of 18 channels in parallel get to be exciting. Uh, beyond the data separator, you, you start thinking in terms of the serializer deserializer or format or deformatter, which is very different, I think, between DASI and tape, but fundamentally the same idea. You're taking the customer's data and surrounding it with things, one of There's which... There's a layer of CRC. The, one check. of the yeah. things of which yeah. would be one. an ECC or a CRC, and then tape uh, it was really uh, pioneering, actually, with this well, product. Well, it's because we could. Because we had the 18 parallel channels, we could afford to uh, put the ECC intelligence in. That was very difficult to do with a single-track device until you got more into RAID uh, type of, types of things. <coughs> this, this, this guy stuck it on the end. And, you know, well, you did. You demarked bad sectors. You did a lot of other things that tape sure. didn't do. We just plowed right through bad tape and yeah. just and then, rewrote it downstream if we didn't like it. Then there's a whole microcoded error recovery process, which may yeah. include lots of. And back then, it was more like assembly language on bit slice pieces of. I mean, there wasn't even microprocessors really. Yeah. And then finally, you've got the, the channel changed. interface, which is a whole other art. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, so to the extent that just that to refreshes your recollection, they're, they're not represented here, but I don't want them to nope. be forgotten. And then maybe some other time. Understood, accepted, and agreed with. Okay. So uh, do you wanted to start on automation. Yeah, I want to start about automation. I'll set it up, and then my colleagues will help me. I, and I apologize that there certainly are some automation. Uh, veterans of the automation wars in Tucson. Uh, it wasn't initially an agenda item, so I didn't try to smoke those people out. But if you uh, like the controller story, if we wanted to come back someday and, and give it the treatment it deserves, uh, there's still Bert Slossens around, maybe there's a Day around, maybe there's whoever. But, but let me set it up like this. Uh, without being at all defensive, STK deserves credit where credit is due. Let me tell you that in automation, in IBM, it wasn't that nobody thought about it. It wasn't that it was some big foreign thing. We certainly shipped it, and the mass storage system was a fully automated uh, solution. 
But my understanding is the conversation went kind of like this. If we do it, how much market share are we going to gain? Oh, probably none. If we don't do it, how much are we going to lose? Oh, probably none. There was a perception in IBM that at the time labor was relatively low cost and why are we asking customers to replace a, real, uh, a relatively low cost labor component that used to be called tape hangers with a potentially a multi-million dollar capital investment that now the customer would not only have to make that investment in place of the labor, but they would then need to protect that investment in perpetuity, which of course is what later came to happen. So there was a view in IBM that it just wasn't going to be that helpful to our business. We did recognize that some form of an automated cartridge loader would be value to a customer. We made something that hang off, hung off the front. You could stack, I don't know, six or eight cartridges in it so that you could kind of queue up a series of jobs, which, which cuts your labor a little bit. And other than that, uh, we, it kind of went dormant until STK started rattling their sabers and releasing little bitty, itsy bitsy bits of news and fuzzy pictures of this thing that was coming. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of I people at IBM kind of wrote it off and kind of viewed it as SDK's folly and, and customers aren't going to want it. Prove us wrong, and they did. My hat's off to them. Uh, they discovered that there was a demand that we weren't aware of. Customers weren't beating us up for it. Could have just been a heck of a marketing job they did. It could be they had a heck of a value proposition that we hadn't thought of yet. So we got drug into it to maintain market share that we started losing for not doing it. And we didn't know. Because our analysis of if we don't do it, we won't lose market share didn't assume that anyone else was going to. That was the big flaw. So obviously we had to scramble. And there was no way with our development cycles where we were going to be able to respond to SDK in a timely way without getting hurt pretty bad. So uh, come to the rescue once again are planners that think they're engineers. I already, a guy named, I believe his name was Herb Day, planning guy, apparently he had some kind of stock in a company called Growl. Growl had this gigantic robot, two ton yellow robot arm that was used in the automation of uh, automotive assembly and painting, there it is. Let me see that and I'll hold it up to the camera. Uh, so the idea was, uh, let's make a train track. So, so we already had these strings of things, so now let's make a train track. And let's put this, this robot is a heck of a lot bigger than this picture it does justice to me. It was a monster and it was heavy. And so we did engineering like, uh, what's the wheelie coefficient? What's the peely coefficient? How fast can you accelerate it before it wheels? And how slow before it peels? And the engineers, frankly, were a little embarrassed about this concept. But it was probably the quickest path to market with an answer that uh, met any sort of minimum requirements. And so we. Uh, I won't use the word I normally use. I'll just say we've shoved it out there. And and much later on, we, of course, did considerably more intelligent things. And that's kind of what I remember. And uh, it's really, in my opinion, uh, STK's story to tell, deservedly, as just a part of uh, tape uh, history in general. But. Uh, we, we got a pretty big black guy out of that, and we ultimately recovered. Uh, that was Irv Daly? Uh, Herb. Herb Daly? Day, day, day. Day, day, day. Day. And for all I know, he's planning. still in Tucson somewhere. He was a big guy in the middle of a lot of that stuff. And the company that... He, that the I, yellow robot came from a company called Growl, and I don't know how to spell it. Growl? G-R-O-W? -E like uh, we could Google it. Google we could look, look it up. Google that stuff. Thank you. Uh, and uh, later on, of course, we uh, became very innovative in that space. We developed our own internal products. We had a lot of robust library management function that we put in them for optimizing uh, 
how to get jobs done, where to do things, all the way up to the high density frames that were very innovative. But uh, we were pretty much uh, second to, to market in that race. I, I was telling you earlier, you being <laughs> top, uh, my recollection really falls very, very closely to the, the same story that John said. I was the, I had the storage uh, subsystems at the time when I came came to IBM, Tucson, and I had a manager that was responsible for the following tape library. We had the 3880 mass store. We had con concepts that were probably more elegant than the growl thing at the time. Um, and when I moved over to the, to the to the tape products manager, that manager moved with me and reported me. He probably got let go back in that 87 layoff. But but anyway, so, and, and I, I, I would think that when we did the cartridge itself, that the, manage, that the people had an idea that you could automate that. You know, cartridge, you know, just conception, because they already do, had done a mass store. So so the same people were inventing 38, I mean, 30, uh, 30, uh, 3, 3840. Kind of 3480 uh, would have already had to have that in their mind. But anyway, and as I said uh, earlier, is that the, the biggest problem was was getting the planning group who were responsible for establishing the volumes, the business case part of it, because we knew what the cost structure would be, to give us enough volumes to be able to justify the product, to take it really fully into development to justify it. And, uh, and, and the funny part of that story uh, you know, so we basically didn't really implement. The funny part of that story is the same planning managers, the planning people who couldn't build a business case, then are then engineered the engineered the problem <laughs> <laughs> because I heard they it was working for Andy and those guys. Uh, so it was, you know, it's kind of it's that kind of story. You know, if you can't build a business case, it's really hard to justify the amount of money because it wasn't going to be a small effort to be able to put a library in place. Nor was it going to be a small cost to our customers to adopt. Right. But anyway, so you know we're we're basically kind of I would say in agreement with what how what really happened, and we finally did get out there. Yeah. So, any thoughts or speculation? I mean, you essentially had 100 percent of a market with the 3850. I mean, there was you there was really yeah, nothing. There wasn't a big volume, small but, market. Well, I mean, that was the issue. You know, that's usually where business planners start. You're here to at a point and you either come out with a new lower cost product at the same performance point or the higher price product at a higher at a much higher performance and yet somehow that didn't seem to get, happen for this product until STK came along. Exactly. That's exactly the, what happens. We couldn't build a business case. Our, our planners weren't, business planners weren't creative enough to really understand what <laughs> what was what made probably what was going to drive that that space, and I didn't remember people saying that, you know, are we going to lose or win market with it? It's probably, uh, and John's quite right there. I'm just saying I I don't remember that part of it, but you know, it's 35 years ago or 30 years ago. <laughs> I don't remember everything, but we 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 did have we did have we were spending resources on it. We had mm -hmm. design people work mechanical oriented design people more than. More so than anything else. So. And we, we ended up not doing it for were you, a long time. Were you driving in the direction that STK went, which is mechanizing the physical library as opposed to the way you had done it with the 3850, which is virtualizing the physical library? I mean, you know, it's a very two different approaches between a 3850 and a STK 4200, I think. Well, the result was what I would call kind of a brute force solution. You replaced a tape hanger with a robot arm. Yeah, which is basically what uh, SDK did. Is I they, don't think there was any other. That's what our plan was. So our plan was just to replace. It wasn't to try to you know do a replacement product per se for the for the mass okay. store. It was really we got a, we got a, we got a cartridge that we can automate. All we had to do was load it in. Just and you put, you have places to store it and you move it from here to there. And that's what we were planning to do. I mentioned uh, the legacy you have of it. So. So not only was it, oh yeah, not, not only was there an internal uh, discussion about business planning, but what was the value proposition to a customer? Is what we couldn't quite get our hands around. And let me tell you something that happened that I know for a fact happened. I know for a fact that Herb Day promised a lot of customers that if they bought the big yellow robot, that IBM would protect that investment for the life of that asset. 
it becomes an albatross around our neck through time. We had to be able to upgrade the technology, upgrade all the media, even stick 3590s in there at some point in time, way down the road. And so when you're trying to sell to, so if you're not willing to make that type of a promise to a customer, it was really hard to get them to make a huge capital investment just to lay off a few tape hangers that you're probably still going to need to get tapes in and out of the library anyway. We didn't know how to make a customer value proposition out of automation. We had no idea that customers would want to adopt it. And, and I think we were blind side. But I don't know. What, what do you think STK's value proposition turned out to be? Was it inflation that drove the labor cost up? Or My, no, I think, that bad they made, I think that they made promises that uh, we hadn't, hadn't even occurred to us to make. Mm -hmm. Lifetime investment that it would be Protecting replaced the with. Protecting investment, uh, always making sure new technology was compatible with uh, what they've already bought. Uh, also, they made some other promises. Uh, their implementation was a little different from ours. They could scale differently from us. So when we finally did get to market with the big growl machine, it really wasn't a very scalable solution. I suppose we could throw a couple more things on the end of the string and make the railroad track a little bit longer. And that basically was our linear architecture for all of our high-end automation devices. But a library image was a library image, and if the data of interest was not in that image, it basically wasn't available to us. STK invented something called pass-through, and they had this beautiful honeycomb geometry where they could glue a couple of, have a, have a common side on two of these things and get a cartridge from way over here to way over here when they needed to. So I think there's some things that they anticipated correctly. I mean, they took a gamble, I'm sure, that this was a big risk in their business. It was a risk we weren't willing to take. And uh, I think they might have made initially some better architecture decisions than we made. And they were able to promise customers more in the way of investment protection and give them that insurance that this large capital investment has a long-term payoff to you, not just in labor cost. But unfortunately, that's a lot of speculation on my part. Yeah. I'd love to hear their side of the story. Yeah, I think they, in fact, did deliver on that promise. They did. Yeah. Oh, it's well, we never did do pass through. We had a million excuses why we didn't think it was worthwhile and it was no good, and yet it was just our head in the sand. Plus, Gosh, I think I think they put LTO in the in that sure. library. They put DLT in it. They put anything in it. You know, whatever the customer wanted, and we weren't quite that willing to do that because our bread and butter. Once we went away from the lease model, our bread and butter was turning it. We wanted to turn it. We want to replace all your media every five years. We want to replace all your drives every five years. And we didn't have a business model for automation that was even compatible with the business model we were operating under. We'd have to go back to leasing if we wanted to make those types of promises. I, I'm spe I, I want to warn you, I'm super speculating here, but I'm just kind of reacting to your comments. You know. Yeah, there's, there, there were better ideas that we, we consciously refused to adopt because it probably wasn't compatible with what we wanted to do. Joel, you're shaking. No, I agree with you. Agree? I, mean, I, I was not involved in the area that John's talking about, but I, I'm agreeing with him and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Any last comments on 3480 or Tucson? Thank you for having us. Oh. This. It might have been a pleasure. Coming down and listening. Uh, it's a real honor for us to participate. We appreciate it. I, I failed to mention that I did visit the Computer History Museum a couple of months ago on my own time. Oh. I was up here. And we Woods. appreciate I that. Should have let you know. Give you my reaction to it. I walked through it on my own and I thought this is the most cluttered lab full of junk I've ever seen. <laughs> because that's what it looks like when you don't know the schema. So I was about to leave, and, 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 and so I was kind of on the alert for tape artifacts, and there's a couple of tape drives here and there, but I noticed no, nothing modern, no 3480, no 3490, no LTO. It was all vacuum column stuff, because that stuff is fun to look at, I guess. And so there were a few tape cartridges. Uh, they weren't labeled particularly accurately, and they weren't even, in my opinion, the the winners in the marketplace, they were just something somebody cleaned their desk out, I guess. 
about to leave, and uh, I noticed that the docent was queuing up to her, and I decided, well, I'll go for the guided tour. And all of a sudden, everything clicked really nice and real smooth. He talks about man's eternal fascination with computing, better ways to add and subtract, and we start with mechanical computers, the abacus, moving up through a whole series of mechanical computers, Enigma machines, and then we go to analog computers, and we could finally get to digital computing, computing, and it's bigger, faster, 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 make the wires shorter, make them round, then chips, large-scale integration, and then that runs out of gas because of power, so now we're going to do parallel processing, and the whole thing really flows when it's guided, and I would recommend uh, a headset or some way for people to, to do that because even as a relative expert in the field, it was pretty hodgepodge to me walking through by myself. Um, of course, I was alert for tape stuff, and there wasn't much. There was an operational ramp that three old guys would turn on and off periodically. There was the 1401 demo room, but that isn't really on the museum floor, and a large amount of the public probably leaves once they get through the uh, walking tour. So I'm excited about the fact that you are interested, more interested in tape. I was invited to join the Story Sig by Tom, the other Tom, years ago, and I detected, and I sent some stuff in, and I participated in a few calls, but I, I didn't sense any real love for my presence uh, because there's like, John, there's like John Bess and Chris Bajorix and Bob Scranton's and basically the whole San Jose Disc Mafia sitting there. You know who invited this guy? <laughs> so this is refreshing. Uh, Thank you very much, because it deserves a place. Leave you with one last thought on that. But I always told people, in my view, after 30 years of immersion, and not just in IBM, but throughout the industry, knowing everyone in the world who participated, tape is the disc as China is to Japan. Tape is the mother culture. Tape came first. Tape always was the leading edge everywhere. Tape was all the way down in the trash 80s, long before a disc was down there in the form of a cassette. Um, so, so the Japanese are faster, shinier, smarter, but they still, uh, you know, are wary of the mother culture, and they still acknowledge the mother culture. And uh, I just wanted to say that for your benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, thank you. Well, th and again, Joel, thank you for hosting us. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. It is now Wednesday, our third day in Tucson on uh, tape history, and we've brought back uh, Joel Levine to uh, talk about his very early days in Poughkeepsie. Uh, as a technician making tape drives, including the hypertape. Joel? Hi. Uh, one of my first memories of IBM. I joined IBM March 1960, was given a little short tour through the plant, show me where the men's room is, the parking lot, and etc. And I'm walking down the hall and I see these enormous test cells where they were assembling uh, systems, including the tape drive, and they put them all together and cabled them all up to test them before they went out to customers. Overhead, these large signs of the name of the customer where they were going. And I see all these names like the telephone company and the IRS and Boeing aircraft and names of that caliber, of that level company, major, major corporations. I'm saying to myself, this job's not going to last. I said, there's not that many corporations, you know, or government entities of that size that would possibly could buy and afford to buy all this equipment. Okay, where are they going to put it? It must cost a fortune. I said, this job's just not going to last. And here I still am. <laughs> and these Thank you. test cells were? The test cells, I'm guessing, but I bet they were 
a couple thousand square feet, at least, say, if they were 50 by 50, that'd be, what, 2,500 square feet? They were at least that big. They were large, okay? And they were the uh, 700 series uh, computer systems, and, uh, and they were hot. That's the other thing I remember about it, the heat, because they were all vacuum tubes. The heat they generated, and they had all these fans all around, and these little like portable air conditioners sitting on little, uh, almost like a pallet. Okay, try, but it was hot in there, and uh, and then the, the biggest thing was I couldn't believe there was enough companies in the world that could afford these things, and uh, I was convinced the first week I worked there that this job wasn't going to last. But it did for 30 years. Now, now these were complete systems put together. Yes. And then totally all the tape drives, the channels, the mainframes, all and all the peripheral equipment was all cabled together and tested as a total system before it was disassembled and shipped to a customer. So, uh, but uh, the thing in my mind is the job wasn't going to last. But also, you worked an interesting shift. Situation oh, yeah. and then, at Poughkeepsie. Um, well, I was working on the 729 assembly and then test line, and they started to install all these uh, the 360 system as it was it was announced right in that general time frame, and they got the technicians to go out to install the tape drive part of the systems at different customers. So we ended up working. Um, like a couple days off during the week, but we will work on Saturday and Sunday and given a couple days off during the week. And almost every weekend, we would fly to some city, help the local CEs at the time, the customer engineers, install the system, upgrade it, whatever changes they wanted. You know, we worked like two 12-hour shifts uh, you know, starting Friday at five o'clock when the company was closing down, and the name of the game is you were going to be finished by eight o'clock Monday morning. Uh, that was like the answer to the question, and we'll give you the question later. Um, and I got a chance to go to many, many different cities all across the country. I can't tell you a thing about the city because it was get off the plane, check in at the hotel or motel, and go to work. And after working 12 hours, you weren't interested in sightseeing anyway. So that's how the weekend is. And some of the places were really interesting. I remember being sent down to Brookhaven uh, Labs in Long Island. And uh, they gave me all sorts of stuff to let me through the door and the gate because of security reasons and all that. And uh, the uh, so I was given all these special credentials and things to get through the door, and I get up to the gate and the guard is waving me on, like he doesn't want me to stop uh, because I was gonna hold up traffic, and here I was so convinced I had to give him all this information that they gave me to prove that I was okay to go through the gate, and he's just waving me through. He doesn't, so he waves me through the gate and I'm saying to myself, now where do I go? Because I was gonna ask the guard, <laughs> where to, where's this building I was supposed to, to go to? So that was a lot of fun. Um, I remember we installed a system at Rand out in California, the Rand Corporation, and uh, versus the guard who waved me through, we were met by guards, multiple guards, and stood next to us through the whole weekend. I had to take a break. I said, where's the men's room? And he says, we will go there together. And I sort of looked at him funny, but there we went, and yes, he stood next to me, and I was never more than probably six feet away from this guy through the whole weekend. Um, he was a big guy. I'm not that big. That was interesting. Um, a lot of stories like that. Um, Any we installed one in Reader's Digest in New Jersey, and uh, this guy comes out from Reader's Digest and he says, that thing's either working by 8 o'clock Monday morning when we start in again, or you 
push it down to the freight elevator, and let me show you where the freight elevator is. <laughs> he made his point. Um, it worked. Um, a lot of stories of that nature. Sure. So did, did they pay you for your travel time? Or yes, you, so? yeah. they paid for the travel. Obviously, they paid all the expenses on, you know, as far as travel, a hotel, and, and all the rest. But, um, and there was a certain amount of overtime we were paid because we were all hourly employees. Okay, but we were also given a couple days. Uh, so it was a five-day week with a lot of overtime, if you think about the Saturday and Sunday part. Yes, 